Right. Good evening, everyone. Today is June 27, 2023. It's about 9.07 p.m. We are reporting live from the outside of the Moynihan train hall, brand new Moynihan train station. And it's a bit cold out tonight. It's about 79 degrees Fahrenheit. It was cloudy all day. And next week is already July, if you can believe that. Today what I want to do is take a trip to the west side. I believe they just opened a brand new extension for the High Line, which I believe we have to head down this way and then go to 30th Street, I believe is the new, I think they're calling it the Moynihan extension. So hopefully the rain will hold out. I was checking the weather before we started streaming. And it says it's supposed to rain at 9.30. So I have the umbrella, hopefully it'll hold off. But before we get started, I wanted to bring everybody's attention to a very important interview uh, that took place today on CNBC. So if you didn't see it today at six o'clock in the morning, um, Seth Klarman, who we talk about quite often here on the live stream, arguably one of the greatest value investors of all time, right up there with Warren Buffett. And I told you guys this story before about Seth Klarman. And it was, I was watching a particular recording of one of the Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meetings. And one of the questions from the audience that was asked to, I believe Warren Buffett was, the question was, you know, Warren, if you had to recommend anybody, any investor beside yourself, 
to really pay attention to and listen to, who would it be? And Warren Buffett, you know, sort of thought long and hard about it. And he really wasn't going to give an answer. Uh, but then he's like, you know what? I would recommend two particular people, one of which being um, the author of Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, which is Phil Fisher. So he said, I'd recommend Phil Fisher and then Klarman. Yeah, maybe Klarman, which is Seth Klarman, who happens to be the CEO and founder of the uh, Baupost Group uh, in Boston, right here in New York. So if you haven't caught that interview, uh, I would go to my Twitter page. You can follow at Walks Wall Street. And I've actually uploaded the entire interview for all of you to see. Um, one of his biggest positions, I think in his fund, if you look at the 13F, is actually Coinbase, which is a little bit interesting, right? Because Coinbase is a company that's not profitable. Uh, it's been really beaten down with all of the bad news and the bearish sentiment that's going on in the cryptocurrency market, specifically with new regulatory uh, scrutiny coming down from the SEC, which we've talked about almost to the point of ad nauseum now, right? With Gary Ginsler uh, suing not only Binance, but Coinbase, and I believe Gemini as well. Of 2022 actually marked the top in crude. Uh, I believe it was March 14th, 2022 to be exact is when crude oil was rallying pretty strongly to about $130 a barrel. You couldn't escape the financial calamity when you turned on CNBC, Bloomberg, pretty much all of the major financial channels. There was analyst after analyst coming on with these outlandish, ridiculous price targets for crude. There was even some particular Bloomberg articles uh, showcasing notable analysts from Goldman Sachs, BNY Mellon, BNP Paribas. Uh, calling for $250 a barrel crude oil. Well, ever since then, we've actually gone in the exact opposite direction. Crude is down almost 50% from all time record highs. So we're gonna talk about what that means, right? Because oftentimes we could use commodities as leading economic indicators. Uh, and one of the things uh, that we've been talking about specifically is the zero COVID policy in China that has now been relaxed. So myself included, right? There was many notable, I should say, analysts on Wall Street, economists, and notable voices on Main Street that were calling for an economic boom, right? A huge spending demand uh, in China at the conclusion of the zero COVID policy. Well, we couldn't have been more wrong, right? If you look at the China PMIs, just like how we review the ISM PMIs for the United States, uh, China's not doing too well, right? Both on the manufacturing side uh, and the service side, which you wouldn't really think. So the relation there that I try to make with crude oil is that crude topped last year. And that sort of was a leading economic indicator in terms of global macro that maybe the zero COVID policy concluding wasn't going to bring about that robust economic boom that many people on Wall Street and Main Street, including myself, thought. So we'll talk about that. Let me go ahead and close my laptop, everybody. Once again, we are reporting live right outside of Madison Square Garden, the brand new Moynihan train hall overlooking the gorgeous Empire State Building. It is a picture perfect night. Hopefully the rain holds up and we are going to be headed towards the High Line. Now, I believe the High Line closes at 10 o'clock. So we may just have enough time to go on the brand new extension. I think they just completed about two days ago, the new extension that I think they're calling the Moynihan extension. There was a lot of press. I believe the governor of New York state, Kathy Hochul was here for the grand opening ceremony. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend that, but I'm excited to walk around and check it out. I'll go ahead and close my laptop and then we'll say hello to the team in the chat and we'll get started. So allow me one moment.
All right, everybody, what's up? Good to see all of you. I see Vinny Castellano, I see Carol Reeve. My good friend Fred X is here, always a pleasure. I see Jonathan Earl, Michael Scott, Richard Scott, a lot of Scots in the chat tonight. British Gray Jr., Joe Driver, Bill is here. Good to see you. So let's get started. Let's head towards the High Line because I think we're crunching it a little bit on time here. I see Unij23, CA23, uh, Hawaii is here, Paul Brunel. Very good to see you. Um, I believe this closes at 10 o'clock. Probably around, what, 9-ish? 9.15. So I think we may just be able to get on. Hopefully tomorrow we will st actually start the stream on time. Hopefully, please, God, I do apologize. We've been uh, starting the stream quite late as of most recent, but we should be back on a regular scheduled programming very soon. It's just been very busy at work, working on a lot of interesting and exciting things. Hopefully I'll be able to share that with you guys very soon. Western Mass Dave, always a pleasure. Wishing you my best, as you know. Good to see you in here. Susanna Q4, welcome, welcome. I think we're starting to feel some raindrops here. I see photos from around New York saying there's a 30% chance of rain. Indeed. All right, one more shot of the Empire State Building. Uh, hey, John, this is Tom. I sold all my Caterpillar a month ago uh, to manage risk and bought Google instead. Of course, Cat goes right back up again. You know, it's interesting. So Caterpillar, um, it's interesting you, you mentioned that, right? So Cat, ticker symbol C-A-T, was actually a big market leader in 2021, going into the latter half of 2022. But, you know, right as those PMIs started to roll over, both in the US and China, guess what happened? You know, Caterpillar really fell apart, right? So maybe we could use that, you know, sometimes you could even use specific equities uh, as leading economic indicators, right? So sometimes you could use the price of specific equities and specific sectors uh, as a leading economic indicator to say, what is the market trying to tell us here? So it kind of makes sense, right, John? With crude rolling over, right, going all the way from $130 a barrel down to now, what, $67? Not many people thought that. The XLE, which is the Spiders ETF that tracks the energy sector, also rolled over quite materially. Um, and you have Caterpillar rolling over in a big way. Now, we talked a little bit about China. This looks like a big tourist group here, which is kind of cool. It is the summer, so you're probably going to have a lot of summer trips and the like. It's good to see people are finally coming back to explore the city. It's a great place to come for sure. But look, China manufacturing activity continues to fall off a cliff. Now. I want you guys to look this up because I don't, quite frankly, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think the May 2023 uh, China PMI numbers came in at 48.8. Uh, that declined even further from April. I think we got a 49.9 reading. So in, in layman's terms, any reading below 50 uh, signals contraction in the manufacturing sector of the Chinese economy. Uh, vice versa with the US, right? Just depends on which PMI report you're looking at. So what does Caterpillar make? They make a lot of industrious equipment, right? Um, heavy equipment operating uh, machines and things like that. So if manufacturing activity is rolling over, well, maybe that means less demand uh, for Caterpillar. I think I gotta open up my umbrella here in a moment. This is the on-ramp as you're heading towards the tunnel. Hey, Fred X is here, good to see you. Shadow Ship, just have a good night everybody and Tom, thank you so much. Sabrina Fair, what is going on? Pineapple Water, this is hey Tom. Oh, very cool, at 5 p.m. got to Florida at 4.30 a.m. LaGuardia is a nightmare, wow. Why is that? Maybe due to the storms? Well, good thing you made it back in one piece. Is that the really nice hotel on Fifth Avenue? Is that the one? 
Uh, I'm horrible at the pronunciation, but if I'm not mistaken, that hotel is really nice. Uh, right there on Fifth Avenue. I believe it has unobstructed views, depending on which floor you're at. Uh, the Empire State Building, really nice. We haven't walked up that way uh, in a long time. Somebody says, please know one of my good friends is a Caterpillar retiree. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying, I, you know, markets are cyclical in nature. Hold on one second, I gotta turn my notifications off. We'll be hearing uh, pinging noises all, all night. Hold on. Now, one of my, hey, Sally's here, Mighty Bull, what's up? Patrick New York is our good moderator. Now, one of my favorite features, okay, I'm gonna give you guys a tip, and maybe you already know it, but, because we're gonna talk about Apple as well a little bit today. One of my favorite features on iOS, so on the iPhone, is the do not disturb feature. That is the best feature of all time. It essentially uh, silences all notifications. And it's good to turn on after office hours, right? Especially if you need to time box and get a lot of work done. Sometimes you need to let clients wait a little bit. You know, what I've found over the years is, you know, if a client, you know, you should always be hyper responsive. However, if a client is sending you a message, you know, at 11 o'clock at night or midnight, uh, you need to prioritize your project, right? So maybe you're working on a big pitch deck for tomorrow morning. You got to get that done. So if you respond back at 7.30 in the morning, that's fine. They don't need the response at, you know, midnight, one in the morning. In most cases, right, you just need to prioritize it. But the do not disturb mode really helps me on with doing that. Hey, John Lee is here. He says, hey, Tom, what did you think about the rally today? Uh, after yesterday's sell-off, bulls seem to be in control, says John Lee. Yeah, so the market recovered a little bit today, you're right. Um, here's what, well, let's say in a perfect world, right, if I had to uh, give my thoughts on what I'd like the market to do. The market generally tends to not do what I'd like it to do. But over the past couple months, we've had this big broad-based uh, rally in the equity market. Right, that includes all of the major equity indices. So the S&P 500, the Dow 30, and the NASDAQ. Now, we are well off the lows, uh, which is good. However, if you were talking to a bear, they would say, well, you have to look at the overall market breadth, the breadth of the market. And they would say the majority of the rally has been made up of a very select few mega cap tech stocks. Now that's true in a way, but that's also not true. And I know that sounds like it's contradic contradicting itself. But if you look at the NASDAQ advanced decline line, if you look at the percentage of stocks that are now trading above the 200 day moving average, this is the Hudson Yards, by the way. So that's the vessel structure, which is really nice. Uh, breadth has actually improved quite materially in the market. Uh, the percentage of stocks trading back above the 200 day is improving in a big way. Um, so that's good. We're starting to see participation from small caps, uh, at least the inclining of participation from small caps. Uh, you could look at ticker symbol IWM, which is essentially the ETF that tracks the Russell 2000, right? But here's the thing about the summer. Over the summer, volumes generally tend to dry up on exchanges for obvious reasons. A lot of people take vacations, uh, big money managers, mutual fund managers, hedge funds, family office people and the like. They tend to all be out in the Hamptons or Connecticut or taking vacations around the world. So a lot of the trading activity dies down. Uh, it's called the summer doldrums. So I posted this on Twitter a while ago. And I said, what I would like to see this market do as it relates to the major equity indices is I would like to see the market give back a little bit, right? And that's called handling. So if the market pulls back, right? If you get, you know, a five to 7% correction across the board in the S&P, the NASDAQ, particularly the NASDAQ 100, right? Higher beta stocks. 
I think that would be, be good so long as the volume isn't really disturbing, right? If this market corrects on crazy volume, uh, blasts through the 50-day, blows through the 200-day moving average on higher than normal volume, then that would probably signal that, you know, this bear market rally is exactly a bear market rally. But I don't, I, I don't personally think that'll happen. I think that we will see a normal bullish correction at the start of a new bull trend, right? So that is, that is my uh, stance. Now that doesn't mean I'm gonna be right, um, but that is how I'm positioned and that is my stance, right? Again, doesn't mean that's gonna happen. Many people would disagree and maybe I'll be wrong, but I always try to lean a little bit more optimistic uh, than consensus. And from the people I talk to, both on Wall Street and on Main Street, um, a lot of fund managers are underexposed equities. Uh, and a lot of people are overexposed. Maybe I shouldn't say overexposed. I should say they have a lot of exposure to fixed income, which is great, right? Because finally, <laughs> you know, after a decade, fixed income is actually yielding uh, a pretty appropriate return, right? I mean, just take a look at the yield curve uh, this week. I believe the one year US Treasury yield uh, is back above that 5% range. So, you know, five and a quarter risk-free rate of return on your money is kind of nice. Um, but if you look throughout history, uh, usually uh, equities outperform fixed income. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't have any exposure to fixed income. I think we just may be able to make it. So this is the entrance to the high line. The new entrance, I think we have to make a right here. So I'll quickly give you guys one more shot of the beautiful vessel here at Hudson Yards, and then we'll head to the High Line. Hey, Junior is here. Says, I like the summer pullback. Uh, time to buy, Christmas comes early. Maybe, we'll see. We'll definitely see, 100%. Uh, David Beckham is here. Good to see you. Welcome. Ryan Beck says, I hate to say it, but I can't wait to see New York City. Uh, decked up for its Christmas attire. Ooh, that is nice, but I think I could wait a little bit. I mean, Ryan Beck makes a good point, right? New York City is absolutely gorgeous during the holidays, but you know what's absolutely crazy that I can't understand? Guys, next week is gonna be the 4th of July. Like, just really try to wrap your head around that for a moment. I think tomorrow is officially halfway through the year, and next week is July, and it's not even hot out in New York. I mean, think about that. It's like 71 degrees today. It was cloudy. I mean, we, we need to be getting up in the 80s, if not 90s. Um, is there a conversation? In my view, anyway. The summer's too short, the spring is too short, and the winters are way too long. And we are not off to a good start in the summer, my friends. It is kind of cold. Hey, DWG says, I haven't found one YouTube economist so-called that is positive about the immediate market. Yeah, I mean, you know, DWG makes a good point, and I think it's appropriate to talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, well, let me get my umbrella out, because it is raining. I don't know if you guys could see it, but it is raining. Um, I think this may be the new Ur side. Wow, somebody says it's a hundred and six degrees uh, in Florida today. Or oh, oh, with the heat index. See, that's the type of weather I love, my friend. That's the type of weather I love. When I was in Miami, I think they may be closing this down. Uh, but when I was in Miami, it was about maybe 87 degrees, but with the humidity and the heat index, uh, it felt like, 10, like 102, I think it felt like. Uh, but it's nice. But anyway, so let's sort of go back to what DWG said for a minute. And I think this has to do with uh, marketing and cognitive bias. So we'll talk about that for a moment. And look, it's not to say one is worse than the other. It's not to say one is worse uh, than the other. But if you notice a lot of the very prominent um, channels 
who do a lot of financial commentary. There's really, you could draw a stunning direct correlation between the amount of hyperbolic uh, gaslighting, uh, fear porn sort of nonsense and viewership, right? And it, it's quite obvious. And I don't think, ma I'm not saying that these channels are bad or these people are bad. It's not what I'm saying at all. There's also the quite the opposite where you have other people or market economists or analysts that are always these hyper bulls on these really garbage uh, equities, these garbage stocks that have no earnings, they have no sales, uh, they have none of the characteristics which make stock go up, stocks go up. No return on equity, no pre-tax, after-tax margins, but you'll have these channels, you know, you know, go all in on, uh, you know, what were those, the meme stocks and the GameStop and all that nonsense. And what I've found is the more uh, hyperbolic you could be, the more not based in fact you could be, uh, the, for some reason, the more uh, attention that attracts. So again, and a lot of people send me these videos about, you know, it'll have a thumbnail with the guy's, like the guy's mouth is always open for some reason. I don't understand, I understand why uh, anytime somebody sends me like a finance video on YouTube, the thumbnail is always a person with their mouth open. And it's, oh, this is gonna be worse than the 2008 financial crisis. This is gonna be worse than 1929. You know, make sure you go to Costco and, and stock up on your canned tuna. And they basically just don't say anything uh, that's based in fundamentals. And it's just, you know, that, that fear, that fear sells, right? And I think the media does this as well. If you ever watched Fox News, they do a great job of doing that. Uh, CNN does a great job of doing that. So the only thing I could say is just focus on the fundamentals, right? Work your process. And, you know, at the very beginning of the live stream, this is a beautiful building, by the way. This is a brand new development. Look at that. Gorgeous architecture, great balconies overlooking the High Line. Uh, one of the things that we talked about in the very beginning of the live stream was today, this morning at six o'clock in the morning, one of the greatest investors of all time, Seth Klarman, okay? Seth Klarman of the Baupost Group uh, actually appeared on CNBC and he never makes public appearances, Seth Klarman. He is a very private guy, very, very smart guy, but he is one of the greatest value investors on Wall Street. And if you listen to that interview, if you go to my Twitter page and you follow at Walks Wall Street, it's one of the first things I tweeted. I actually took a recording um, of the interview and I posted it on my Twitter for everybody to rewatch. And he sort of goes into some of the similar things, right? He says 2021 in the market, you had a lot of this uh, very frothy activity, particularly in the SPAC market, right? And if you've been watching Walks in Wall Street over the past two years, we've been very critical of the special purpose acquisition companies, right? Uh, companies with no earnings a lot of the times, oftentimes pre-revenue, some of these companies. And, uh, you know, I think just watch the, the interview and don't put too much weighting on any one economist, any one um, market analyst, any one trader, any one investor, even me, right? It's, it's so critical to build your own uh, fundamental systematic approach to investing and just work your process, right? That's how you're gonna have outperformance or generate alpha, right, uh, over time. Hey, Daryl is here. It says, hey, Tom, good to see you from Chicago. What's up, Daryl? Good to see you on this rainy night in New York. How are you? Um, I see Abdullah Houdat Dave is here. Welcome. Always a pleasure to see you, Dave. Ah, so Photos Around New York says the building's architect was Zaha Hadid. You know, I see some similarities between the 1000 Museum building in downtown Miami and this particular building here. Very unique, very beautiful. I wonder how cool that would be to have your balcony literally right over the High Line. Hey, Dan Zanks, Tom, I think Steve Gold used to live in that building. I think he did too. 
Um, that's a good point. Yeah, if you guys are unfamiliar with Steve Gold, uh, he is one of the most talented, the most professional in my in my mind, uh, and the most successful, one of uh, the most successful real estate brokers in New York. You may have seen him on Million Dollar Listing New York. I believe he runs a team at Corcoran. And I think you're right. He may have been in this building. Ah, Ryan Beck, yes, you're right. So Dan Zhang and Ryan Beck both pointed that out. I wonder if he bought a unit here or rents, who knows? Hey, hang with Mark Mom, what's up? Hope you're well. I think they're closing down this side of the High Line, but we might as well see how far we could get without before we have to turn back. It's very dark up here in this part, particularly. Yeah, Hawaii is like, I love Million Dollar Listing New York. It's a great show. It's an awesome show. Um, some great, very, very professional brokers. Hey, Stoney says, shout out from South Slope, Brooklyn. Good to see all of our viewers from South Slope, Brooklyn. Now check out the contrast between the old architecture and the new. You have all the old buildings in New York. These, I believe, are actually government subsidized housing, if I'm not mistaken. At least they may look like it. Um, but check out the contrast between Midtown Manhattan as well. Now, if you look at the bottom right hand corner of your screen right here, this is actually the very tip of the Chrysler building. You can see the spire, which looks quite beautiful. And I think the rainbow spire may be on the top of the H&M building, if you could see it, uh, right past the New Yorker hotel sign. And then you have the entire Hudson Yards development, which is great. Yeah, Dan Zhang, they did cancel the show, but stay tuned. I will tell you guys this. Uh, so they did cancel the show Million Dollar Listing New York. But stay tuned. Stay tuned. Uh, they may do something that's going to be very uh, exciting. I'll just say that. Hold on, let me uh, clean the camera lens. I think if we go down here a little bit more, we'll be able to see the uh, Empire State Building once we get through all this scaffolding. Beacon, New York's a subsidized housing means you're a loser in America. It does not. It does not mean that at all. I don't know why you would say that. It's a little weird to say. Everybody comes from all different backgrounds, man. All right, I think we'll be able to have the opening here. Hey, Texas 05. This is Amigo, it's been a while. Yeah, 05 is joining us from Corpus Christi, Texas, I believe. Hopefully the weather's treating you guys a little bit better than, uh, than me. Here in New York. It's humid, but it's not hot, which is strange. Richard Vogel, I did see that there was a protest. Um, at City Hall, down by Brooklyn Bridge. Now, I don't want to get too far off track. Hold on, look at these. So again, as we walk through the High Line, look at all these new developments. It seems like everything that's going up uh, that is a new development has very funky and unique architecture. Would you agree? Look at that one down there. I think if we walk a little bit further down, we're gonna come across the building with the huge bay windows. It almost looks like pods, like individual pods that you're living in. The modern architecture in New York. Wow, 05 says, yes, sir, from Corpus Christi. 
119 degrees. Holy crap. That is hot. That is wild. Now, these are all new developments, but the architecture is a little bit more modest. Would you agree? It's not super flashy like the Zaha Hadid buildings. It almost looks like something out of Avatar. These look a little bit more subtle. It blends in with the original character uh, and the original characteristics of the neighborhood. I think I may like these a little bit better. Ooh, somebody's talking about the Seagram building. That's my favorite building. Uh, Keith says, seems buildings that are larger. Oh, I thought you said the Seagram building. I was like, nice. Um, speaking of real estate, you know, did you guys see the news? Uh, I think tomorrow would be more appropriate for me to share the direct sources. I think I retweeted it on Twitter. There we go. That's it. You can see the spire of the Empire State Building here. Beautiful. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about specifically as it relates to real estate, but as it relates to multifamily real estate deals that were done during 2021, uh, a lot of the things we've predicted as a team here are starting to come to fruition in many of these deals. So what do I mean by that? Well, a lot of very, I would say greedy, I'll just use the term greedy because I can't think of another word. Uh, I would say greedy and very, very optimistic investors during 2021 when you had all of that liquidity uh, sloshing around the environment, when you had artificially suppressed rates from the Federal Reserve, a lot of investors, a lot of private equity too, uh, went out and accumulated a ton, and I'm talking about a ton of multifamily units all on floating rate debt. Ooh, I think they're closing it down, so we gotta turn around. And it's better to go out this way. Um, a little bit more stuff going on at the Hudson Yards. So the problem is a lot of these deals that were done, particularly as we were emerging from COVID, uh, as it relates to multifamily, all of these were done on floating rate debt. And as we come up on 2024, some of that debt is going to re-rate at higher interest rates. Or in the future, uh, a lot of that debt is going to readjust uh, higher, right? In this case, higher, because the Federal Reserve has gone on to raise interest rates 18 consecutive times. However, at the June FOMC meeting, which we talked about in great detail, uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell decided to pause the interest rate hiking cycle. Uh, but still, I mean, we've raised interest rates about 500 basis points. So the Fed Fund's target rate, or I should say the range right now, is at 5% uh, to five and a quarter. Now, if anybody watched the uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell testifying in front of Congress last week, one of the things that you would have noticed is that he was talking about a lot of the voting members of the Federal Reserve. And the vast majority of the voting members of the Fed are in consensus that there's at least gonna be one more interest rate hike which is probably gonna happen in the next three weeks here when we have the July FOMC meeting. In which case that'll take the Fed funds target rate to five and a quarter to five and a half percent, which if you look at a lot of the forecasts in the futures market as well, that seems to be where the hiking cycle, if you will, uh, should top out. No guarantees, uh, but that's what it's looking like. So. I think what we're experiencing in the real estate market, a lack of supply, both on the new development front, uh, the existing, or I should say, uh, existing home sales market, and even with rentals, right? Uh, rentals, there is uh, quite a bit of a shortage on the market. However, if a lot of these deals go south, you know, and you're talking about 30,000 units, uh, 15,000 to 40,000 units, some of these deals, you know, that could add another dynamic into the mix, uh, a rather interesting dynamic. This is like a little bit of an overhang here. 
you can see all the way into Midtown. Hey, Smarty Pants, says Tom, you always start at 9 p.m. Does your work day begin at 1 p.m.? <laughs> no, I wish. Um, well, as of late, we've been starting at 9. We're going to get back to 8.30. It's just, um, you know, I've been working like probably 14-ish hour days recently. But that's because I'm working on a lot of big, big stuff that is finally coming to fruition, which is great. Um, but yeah, we should be back on our regular scheduled programming very soon. Hey, Penelope is here. Speaking of Tennessee, he says, Hey, Tom and everybody, I've been so busy. Sold my dad's house for asking price before it was listed on MLS. Wow. But I'm still on edge uh, until closing July 7th. Well, congratulations on the sale. Really? So, Penelope, talk us through that process. Was the, I know you're in the Tennessee market, right? Nashville, Tennessee. Um, is that the market that your father's house was in as well that was being marketed? Because, you know, Nashville was one of those markets during COVID that really took off too. Um, I actually know a lot of my friends who I've met through the years being in tech sales. This is the Zaha Hadid building that we were talking about. Um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of people moved to Tennessee, particularly Nashville. Daryl says, I heard from the urbanist that there are 100,000 empty. Yeah. So that, you know, that's another thing. And uh, Daryl makes a good point. Now, I don't, I don't really like getting too political on the stream, but I will say this. Whenever we talk about how there's a shortage of inventory on the market, uh, it's actually a little bit of a myth technically. So what do we mean by that? Well, I think the number is correct. I think there's over about 100,000 uh, vacant apartments all throughout the city. Now, the reason that they're vacant is because they're mainly in rent stabilized uh, or rent controlled buildings. And that sort of makes the deal upside down, if you will, for a lot of these real estate owners and a lot of these landlords because the cost that would go into getting these units rent ready and fixing them up, they wouldn't make a return on their investment because they're not allowed to set the rents at true market prices, right? So instead of making the investment, fixing up these apartments and getting them rent ready, they just let them sit vacant and they let them sit empty. And that's that's a big problem. And I think the rent control and rent stabilization is, in my opinion, and I know it's a very touchy subject, I respect everybody's opinion, uh, but I think it's doing a lot more harm than good in my view. Uh, I think if we let the free market... Hey, the okay, thanks guys. I think if we let the sort of the free market, if you will, decide, so it looks like we have to walk down this way. Uh, if you let the free market decide market rents, you would actually have a lot more supply on the market uh, than you would have if you had all these, well, than what we do now, because we have all these strict uh, controls. Somebody says, Tom, what would your advice be for someone who wants to get into the Wall Street or get an internship on Wall Street? Are you talking about like a summer analyst job? I think networking is really big, um, you know, depending on if you are a uh, freshman or something in college or sophomore or junior, you really got to join all of the clubs, I would say, at your particular university, like investing clubs, finance clubs. Um, you know, do things that make you stand out. It depends on what type of, there's a lot of different departments within the investment bank, right? You could be in sales and trading. You could be working on big M&A deals, right? Mergers and acquisitions. So it just depends on what you wanna do. I mean, if you wanna be more of like a portfolio manager, uh, what I would do is, you know, get a summer job, save up, you know, 10, 20 grand and Start trading in your own account. 
right? That's assuming you, if you wanna be in the hedge fund business or if you wanna be in portfolio management, because once you start to learn a systematic framework for investing, and even let's say, you know, you saved up, you know, 10 or 20 grand, you put it in a trading account and you start to make some decisions, right? Even if you don't make any money, if you can, you know, market yourself to a portfolio manager, to a hedge fund and say, hey, you know, I actually put real money to work. I made real decisions. And these are the reasons for that decision making. That is a lot, a lot better than somebody just that gets, you know, straight A's in all their classes and never takes, you know, actual risk uh, with real money. Now, uh, that doesn't mean, we'll take a look at the Zaha Hadid building one more time. Uh, that doesn't mean go out and buy a bunch of nonsense, like meme stocks and, and, and garbage. Uh, if you're serious about the business, right, you should learn how to do it properly, you know, uh, and have real reason behind why you bought this particular company. And if you could show that to a hedge fund, you'll probably land an internship, right? But you have to show the reason, right? You know, if you have a top-down, bottom-up, uh, systematic framework for investing, I would write that out and, you know, do like a post-analysis on all your trades and say, this is the reason why I made those decisions. You know, the trade went against me, so I cut my loss here, and this is the exact reason why. Um, and maybe share some of the financial modeling that you're doing on your own. Right, but you gotta be a self-starter and you gotta do it yourself. Um, I don't know, that's what I would say. Be a self-starter, just start doing things yourself. Take risks in the market, but calculated risks uh, and figure it out. And I think you'll have a lot of success. Hey, Battery Grams is here, what's up? Always a pleasure to see you. Aaron Frazier says, I was late to the stream. Where are we going tonight? So we did just walk the High Line, well, at least for like, what, 30 minutes maybe? Uh, the High Line does close at 10 p.m. Now we're gonna head back to uh, 34th Street, Penn Station. It's a little bit rainy. <laughs> Valerie Rogers says, nepotism. Nepotism is the key call for your uncle. Ask for a job. Yeah, I mean, nepotism is big on, on the street and any, you know, in the in the Wall Street world, right? Investment banking and hedge fund business, I'm not gonna lie, but that doesn't mean that it's not possible if you didn't go to a target school, if you, if you don't have, you know, family that works on the street. You could break in and do things yourself, but you gotta be a self-starter. All right, I'll give you an additional bonus tip. Here's my additional bonus tip. If you're a college kid right now, that probably means you're what, 20 years old, maybe a little younger than 20 years old. I'm much older, I'm an old man now. So I don't really have this advantage to my side anymore, but I did, I'm 28. When you're younger, especially as a teenager, people are more willing to lend a helping hand and help you out. So what I would do, if I had to do it all over again, is I would, first of all, I would create a LinkedIn account and a Twitter account. I would get on Twitter. I would follow all of the big names on Twitter that are in the investment business, right? Bill Ackman is very uh, active there. You know, Dan Tapiero, Jim Ropel, a lot, of a lot of big hedge fund managers and money managers are active on Twitter. And I would follow them and I would direct message them and just tell them a little bit about yourself. Hey, I'm a 19 year old kid. You know, I go to XYZ college. I'm interested in portfolio management. Do you mind if periodically I send you some of my equity research? And what's gonna happen is they're not gonna respond. But if you continuously, religiously email them and direct message them some of your research and show them that you're doing your own work, you're making your own decisions, uh, you're you're being proactive and learning. One of these big managers is gonna is gonna text you back, or is gonna message you back and say, "Hey, 
you've been very persistent. You've showed that you know, you're diligent and you're making good decisions and you have a good framework. I'd like to offer you a job. And if you're thinking that's not possible, well, that's what happened with me, right? I would constantly, relentlessly, just email out all of my research to big fund managers that I saw that were doing podcasts on, you know, investing with IBD and Barron's and just show interest, right? Show interest. Say, hey, I saw your podcast, you know, your long idea was really good. However, I have this particular critique and here's why. And just consistently for four, five, six years, send out your stuff, right? And people will notice. And the next thing that happens is you go to a, you know, a coffee hour, then you go to a dinner and then you're lifelong friends with some of these people. Okay, where are we here? We're getting a little bit turned around. Hey, Jay is here. Good evening, Tom and NYC. What's up? Good to see you, Jay. Uh, hang with Mark Moms. Is my son's on LinkedIn and recruiters are always reaching out to him for internships uh, and work while he was completing his master's degree. Yeah, I mean, LinkedIn's a great resource. Um, however, over the years, I think you had a little bit of a competitive edge if you were using LinkedIn around like 2015, 16, right around when I was in college. Now it's a lot of spam I've noticed on LinkedIn. Um, you'd be surprised. I've actually done a lot of deals over Twitter. And I know that sounds crazy. I know a lot of people are like, you know, that's BS, but it's not. You'd be surprised. Uh, there's a lot of big players and big names on Twitter. Hey, Abdullah, what's up? Good to see you. Yeah, Ryan Beck's uh, LinkedIn is turned into Facebook. In, in many instances, for sure. Uh, definitely. You know, Ryan, um, I think you're in the tech sales, tech and telecom sales business. Do you get hammered relentlessly with, um, like those, by those lead generation companies? I mean, it was just relentless. I could, I can't even log into my account anymore because my inbox is just flooded with these lead generation companies that are sort of like mini Zoom infos, if you will. I'm not sure if, I'm sure a lot of you've heard of that particular company. Uh, Zoom Info is like a lead generation company. Trades under the ticker symbol ZI. Uh, Henry Shuck is the CEO. But I believe they actually merged with Discover Org. I think the, the particular company used to be called Discover Org, I think. Wow, Ryan Beck says, no, I don't get many of those. Bill says, lead gen is a nightmare, plus from recruiters. Well, you know when I started to get those? I started to get those when I took my last job. Uh, I was director of enterprise sales. So maybe it was just because of the title. They're like, oh, if you're a sales director, you probably have, you know, maybe account executives working for you or something. So you probably have to, you're probably gonna be making the buying decisions, which in my case was not true at all. But nevertheless, uh, I still got peppered with them. All right, let me catch up on some of the comments here. Hey, go for uh, Hokies. Gee, says working in hospitality industry, I get a lot of messages from talent acquisition companies. Very nice. Hey, could you give us a little bit of an update on what you're seeing in the hospitality industry? Particularly, where, where are you working specifically? Are you in New York? Are you in another major city? How's business been? You know, that's another really good I like to call a Peter Lynch sort of economic indicator, right? Peter Lynch would always say, just go outside, you know, ask your family, friends, colleagues, coworkers, what's going on in the economy. And I have a really good friend. She works at the Park Hyatt Hotel here in Manhattan, which just so happens to be inside the 157 building. This guy has a really nice board, uh, which just so happens to be the first building on Billionaire's Row. And she says that demand has never been higher at the Park Hyatt, particularly on the weekends. 
and the average room rate per night in the Park Hyatt is like $925 a night. Kind of crazy to think about. Uh, it says, I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota and work for inter intercontinental hotels. Oh, cool. Uh, the rates are very high and that is not uh, stopping anybody from traveling. Yeah. So a little bit of consensus there, right? So we have our good friend here from Minneapolis, Minnesota. He's like, hey, we're seeing the same thing here. Room rates are extremely high. Uh, I would go out on a limb and say probably higher than pre-pandemic. Maybe, yes, no. Uh, but that's not stopping anybody from traveling. Kind of crazy, right? Now, I guess that would make sense in a way. Because if you looked at the services PMIs, right? So we always talk about the Institute for Supply Management uh, manufacturing PMIs. And then we talk about the services PMIs. Now, in the United States of America, we are a very heavily based uh, economy on services, right? Not so much manufacturing. However, I think that's going to potentially change a little bit, uh, which we could have that conversation later. Uh, I think manufacturing is going to return to the United States in a big way, but maybe we'll park that conversation for a later date. Um, but services is a huge growth driver to the U.S. economy, because generally speaking, we don't really build things in America. Uh, we're consumers and services PMIs have actually been really good. Uh, well, I shouldn't say really good. I should say improving, which makes sense. Um, hotels are doing really good. You know, look at the, if you want to talk about the equity market, look at those particular individual stocks. Look at Hyatt Hotels. I believe the ticker symbol is H. Look at Marriott. Um, look at Hilton Hotels. I believe all those companies are trading at or near 52 week highs. Uh, Gophers, says we also notice guests are spending a lot more on the extras such as room service and such. Wow. And you know, if you order room service at a hotel, I mean, the markup there is what, at least 50%. Do you think that's a low estimate? I'm trying to think about this in my head. I don't know. I don't remember the last time I've ordered room service, but I'm assuming if you order room service at a hotel, you know, a, bo a bottle of water is probably going to be like seven to eight dollars, right? You know, breakfast could be like sixty dollars, and they probably charge you a service fee too, like a ten percent delivery fee. Hey, Adam Wagner, what's up, man? It says hope all is well. Thank you, sir. Hope all is well with you too. Uh, Audra Henderson. Thank you for joining us, Audra. It says, hello, Tom. Thank you for the insight. Very much appreciated. Likewise, thank you for participating. B. Cruz says, I've put a lot of, uh, put the cart before the horse by scheduling an appointment with the financial advisor. This is B. Uh, Richie says, manufacturing in the U.S. is growing. It is, and I'm very bullish on that. Yeah, Dan Zang says, I'd rather walk to <laughs> Walgreens or 7-Eleven. Look, I mean, I think, you know, maybe this is just the pent up demand from, you know, the uh, COVID fatigue, if you will. Hopefully we don't get banned for saying that word. But I think a lot of people and I forget who said this. I think it was somebody in the chat. I just for, I'm forgetting your name who, uh, you know, about six months ago actually predicted this. I remember reading the comment, you know, and he or she said that this, you know, service sector boom could last a lot more than people expect. Because think about all the vacations that people weren't able to take in 2021, even 2022. You know, I, I was talking to some friends who, you know, were still a little bit shaky about, you know, the virus in 2022. Now, again, I don't want to get in that whole debate, right? I respect everybody's opinions on it, but I think now everybody's pretty chill about it. Like nobody really cares, right? So all of that pent up demand, people are making up for lost time. Also excess, uh, excess savings, right? There's a lot of uh, cash on the sidelines. I think, uh, especially from the pandemic, all those wages, right? Think about the wage inflation we've had here in the United States, particularly during 2021. You had the great exodus, if you will. A lot of people quitting their jobs for more lucrative opportunities, which has forced a lot of corporations to increase their pay. 
So people are making more money than ever before, generally speaking. Uh, wages have been going up. And as you know, us Americans, there's a pretty direct correlation between wage growth and spending. I would call that lifestyle creep. Hang with Mark Moms as 4th of July at Disney and Universal Studios will be sardines packed with tourists. I can only imagine that. Is that where you're going? Uh, hang with Mark Mom? Hey, Gary Carpenter, good to see you. B Cruise is hopefully it helps me become more knowledgeable. 100%. I think it's uh, very appropriate uh, to meet with the financial advisor. You should always have somebody in your corner. Like I talk to my CPA all the time. I mean, you know, my accountant acts essentially as my business advisor, right? Very smart guy. Um, and I think everybody should, I think it's worth the money because you need an extra set of eyes, if you will, right? Um, and somebody that's older and wiser and more educated and has more experience than you to help you with your financial decisions and with business decisions too. I think it's, I think it's important. All right, the umbrella's coming out again. Yeah, Adam's a CPA slash lawyer, the best you can get. I have an amazing, amazing CPA. Um, he's a very private guy. But uh, yeah, he's a lifesaver, let me just say that. Hey, Aussie says, God bless the American consumer. Thank you, yeah. Hey, Melissa2087 says, Tom, do you have any plans for the 4th of July? Well, thank you for asking, first and foremost. Um, I'll ask the same question back to you. But yeah, you know, I think I'm just going to stay in the city this year. Um, you know, quite to the contrary opinion that many people think. I love the city. I love Manhattan during the 4th of July. You know, most people go out to, you know, the Hamptons. They go out to, you know, Connecticut. They go upstate to places like Rye, New York, which I just came from, by the way. I had a big event. I was invited to a big party at the Rye, New York Yacht Club. I've never been there before. My God, totally blew me away. It is so gorgeous up there. I never knew that. Uh, I believe it was on the border of Connecticut. Stunning, stunning up there. Really blew me away. So, yeah, but on the 4th of July, I think I'm just going to stay right here, uh, Manhattan. Maybe go out to uh, dinner with my family. Watch the fireworks. I think the fireworks this year is going to be where? 38th? Between 28th and 40th Street on the east side. So maybe we'll stream that. Who knows? I don't know, anybody else? Who, who has some good 4th of July plans here? Got the hot dog guy. All right, we are now on the corner of 34th Street and 8th Avenue. This is the very famous New Yorker Hotel. Wow, Gophers is all actually be in NYC for the 4th of July. Very cool, love that. Cousin Vinny is here. Melissa says no uh, plans for the 4th of July, but hopefully I'll be getting to Manhattan. Justin and us is family gathering with our camp, or at our camp on the 3rd with fireworks, love that. Ah, Vivian's, it's, it's a family birthday on the 4th, so double celebration. Yeah, I think my favorite 4th of July ever was when I was a kid, we all went to Jones Beach. And I think they still have fireworks at Jones Beach for the 4th of July, uh, but that's always a good time. If you can do that at least once in your life on the 4th of July, I would highly recommend that. Jones Beach, 4th of July, great times. Hey, Cosmo, what's up? Cosmo scary. You know, Cosmo, I think last year, funny enough, uh, Cosmo and I, I believe we were in the same exact location as one another on the 4th of July, but we just didn't see each other. 
Yeah, Sean Brown, thank you so much for your $2 donation. This is Nikola Tesla passed away in the hotel. He did. Thank you for your very kind donation. Appreciate it. Cosmo, maybe I'll see you there this year, man. I'm not sure what your plans are for the fourth, but it was funny. Last year, I think we were standing in the same exact spot. Um, but we did not, unfortunately, were able to connect. All right, let's head back to Broadway. Right, I think I'll close the umbrella. Looks like the rain has stopped, at least a little bit. Hey. I know, Ryan Beck's like, that's the most annoying alarm. That's the alarm that I have on my Vespa, believe it or not. It's actually probably going off right now in the parking garage of the Miami International Airport. Uh, but for those of you who are just joining us, I do want to make sure uh, I give you guys the sort of main topic for tonight's live stream. This is the Long Island Railroad entrance. Great view of the Empire State Building. But one of the main things that we talked about tonight is this morning, if you missed it, uh, one of the most famous investors of all time and one of the most successful investors that has one of the best track records on Wall Street, uh, Seth Klarman of the Baupost Group. He appeared on CNBC, a very rare appearance. He really never goes on TV. He's a very private guy. Uh, he made an appearance this morning at 6 a.m. on CNBC talking about a lot of the stuff we talk about on the live stream, right? A lot of the irrational exuberance that has gone on over the last two years in the market, uh, the big washout that has happened in 2021 and relates to equities and some optimistic uh, points as it relates to the market going forward. So if you want to listen, well, actually, you got to listen to the interview. I'm, I'm going to make that a requirement. Uh, just go to my Twitter page at Walks Wall Street, and I uploaded the entire interview for you guys to watch seamlessly. Um, in addition, I have a book recommendation, speaking of Seth Klarman. Uh, he has written one of the most conclusive and famous value investing books of all time. The book is called Margin of Safety. Now, you can't get a physical copy of the book, but if you just Google Margin of Safety by Seth Klarman PDF, you'll be able to find a PDF of the book where you could print it out or you could download it on your computer, uh, your tablet or your Kindle for reading uh, at your pleasure. If you're in New York, you could feel free to go all the way up here, bang a left on Fifth Avenue and walk all the way up to the Stephen Schwartzman building where you can go in the Stephen Schwartzman building in the New York City reading room and actually take out an original copy of margin of safety, but you can't take it out of the building. You can just read it. I think there was only 5,000 copies ever printed, but you know, a lot of people ask, and we have these conversations about, you know, what, what, how do I get started in the investment business? You know, what should I do if I want to start picking stocks? I think a good place to start is, you know, obviously reading a lot of the Graham Dodd books, right? Uh, Read Margin of Safety by Seth Klarman. Focus on how to valuate companies the appropriate way, right? We've given many free resources here on the stream, uh, especially Professor Demodaran, who is deemed the king of valuation. He has tons of free resources, and he's also a professor right here at New York University, uh, the business school and he uploads a lot of his lectures for free, completely free online uh, on YouTube. Professor Demodaran, I believe his two courses that he teaches that are in really high demand is securities analysis uh, and valuation by Professor Demodaran. So I would check those out. Again, check out the interview. I think you guys are gonna like it. Um, my favorite part about the interview is when he talks about his position 
uh, that he's built in Coinbase. Now you may be thinking, wait, you were just saying he's a big value investor and now you're saying one of his biggest positions in his fund is Coinbase? That doesn't make any sense. Well, you're right, but you're also wrong and right at the same time. The way Seth Klarman perceives value investing is more of like an inoculation, right? You sort of have to have a feel for it. And I think one of the main ways people maybe misinterpret true value investing is just to say, look, I'm gonna look for the, the cheapest dirt cheap company on Wall Street and I'm gonna buy it. But real value investing is about looking for those earnings compounders, right? What are the earnings today? What are the, what are the earnings next year? And what are the earnings projected to be in five years from now? And look, I don't have any exposure to Coinbase, but I think it's an interesting conversation as to why Seth Klarman has such big exposure here. Hey, Pineapple Water says, I saw that interview on CNBC, said Buffett really respects him. Yeah, Pineapple Water. Um, I'm not sure if you ever heard this story. I've told this story many times. Now, this was a while back. Um, it was actually at one of the shareholder meetings. So there's an annual Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meeting that is hugely televised, right, in the investment community. Uh, everybody likes to listen to Warren Buffett. Everybody likes to listen to Ben Graham. And a couple years ago, this may have been like eight, eight, eight nine years ago now, but one of the uh, people stood up and, and asked Warren Buffett a question. And he said, if you could recommend the investment community, one other person to really pay attention to you, that you respect besides yourself, uh, who would you say? This is the Bank of America Tower here with the uh, rainbow spire. This is looking uptown towards Bryant Park. And Warren Buffett really couldn't answer the question at first. He sort of, you know, was thinking, he was looking around the room. He's like, you know what, if I, he's like, I'll give you two names. He's like, if I had to give you two names, it would be Phil Fisher, right? And everybody knows Phil Fisher. Phil Fisher is the famous author of the great book, uh, Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. That's a great book, uh, Phil Fisher. And he says, Klarman, yeah, maybe Seth Klarman. And a lot of people, actually don't know who Seth Klarman is because he's not like this really bombastic character on Wall Street, right? Like you would think of like a Carl Icahn, right? Very uh, big personality, always getting in arguments, always getting in fights. He's not like a Bill Ackman who's always making appearances on CNBC, has a huge presence on Twitter and is very out there. Uh, Seth Klarman is quite the opposite. He is a very, very private guy. Uh, and he almost never makes public appearances on television. So whenever he does, I think it's most appropriate uh, to be all ears for that. Okay, so we are coming up on Fifth Avenue here. We were just at 34th Street, Herald Square. But if you guys are enjoying the live stream so far tonight, feel free to leave a like on the video. You know, I've been seeing a lot of these uh, stores opening up in the city as of late. Has anybody else been seeing a lot of these? Uh, these are those uh, THC smoke shops, if you will. Not a big fan of that. Um, I think the more of those you see, I don't think is, in my view, good for uh, the city. I've been seeing a lot of those pop up on the Upper West Side. Been seeing a lot of them pop up. Uh, here's another one right next to that one. I do not think they're, in my opinion, I do not think they're good for uh, property values. All right, here is the Empire State Building. This is, uh, this is everybody going to the top of the Empire State Building, the observatory. Oh my God, brick stone wall, yeah. 
So I think you actually may have sent me that on Twitter. Did you not? So uh, I can't even believe this is real, but apparently everybody, this is real. So Mark Zuckerberg of Meta, right? Ticker symbol M-E-T-A. And Elon Musk of Tesla, ticker symbol T-S-L-A, are apparently going to have some sort of an MMA cage match. Now, when I first saw that, I thought he was just trolling, right? Because, you know, big personality, Elon Musk, you know, Twitter tends to troll a lot, but uh, apparently it's actually real. I know, photos from around New York says, wait, is that real? Yeah, it's actually real. Um, <laughs> kind of funny. You know, I'll make a comment on it. I want to know your guys' thoughts too. I think if this really happens, which apparently it is, Dana White uh, gave it the thumbs up. He's going to be putting on the event. I think Mark Zuckerberg would handle it in like probably under five minutes. Easily. Hey, Carl Roth's is value investing disruptive technology. This is the brand new Starbucks uh, Reserve Roastery in the basement of the Empire State Building. Starbucks trades under the ticker symbol SBUX. Now this is actually two floors. Now the top floor is actually a bar where you can order alcoholic beverages that are sort of infused with coffee flavors and things. It's kind of interesting. It's actually kind of nice. Uh, I've been in here a couple times. It's expensive. I just went in to check it out, but it's actually kind of cool. Hey, Pineapple Water says you are 100% correct. <laughs> Hawaii says I think Elon will get pounded. You know, I think so too. And the reason why I say that, I mean, I, I, I actually hope it doesn't go on. I think uh, Elon Musk is too in, uh, important of a person to our society. You know, God forbid he gets seriously hurt or damaged. Um, because I think, I don't think a lot of people realize just how serious, you know, MMA fighting is. I mean, these people are very, very highly trained killers, right? Um, and you can get severe damage. But anyway, Mark Zuckerberg has been training jujitsu like a freaking animal, okay? And over the last year, um, I've actually gotten into jujitsu. I roll about once a week, usually when I'm in Miami, and I am so horrible at it. But I'd say I'm a work in progress. And I'm not like a super tall person. Uh, I'd say a slightly above average. And I'll roll with people that are significantly shorter than me and they just totally put me into submission. Like it's not even like, it's, it's no contest. So if Mark Zuckerberg, the multi-billionaire, right? With unlimited resources, that's been rolling jujitsu for I think the last three years and who's won championships. He's actually competed at a high level and won championships. I mean, that's a dangerous guy. I don't think people really realize that. Uh, for people who haven't uh, rolled jujitsu before or who are not familiar with the martial art, if you are skilled in that, I mean, there's, it's just like, it's not even, uh, I don't know how to explain it. I've only just started this year, but you know, people who are good at it, it's like they, once they grab you, it's like, you don't even know what the hell happened. It's like, you're in this weird choke and you're like, how the hell did I even wind up in this spot? Hey, Daniel G, what's up? Daniel G checking in from Buenos Aires. We had a, a pretty lengthy conversation uh, last night about global inflation rates. I, th I thought that was a really good conversation. Um, unfortunately, Argentina is suffering from 114% inflation. Really horrible stuff there. Hey, Cousin Vinny, have a good night. Thank you for joining us. Beautiful view of the empire here. Oh, has he really? So Brick Stonewall says Elon Musk has also trained martial arts in the past. So maybe, I don't know then, I, I think we'll see, but 
Now, if assuming this actually goes on, I think this fight could probably bring in a billion dollars. Right, who here would pay to watch, you know, let's say like $55 pay-per-view to watch Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg? I think I would, right, just for, just for fun, a couple laughs. I think I'd pay 55 bucks for that. All right, let me catch up on some of the comments here. This is a really nice hotel and residences. Now imagine having a high floor apartment in this building. Look at your view. You have absolute unobstructed views of the Empire State Building. Really gorgeous. And you have the uh, kind of a crescent moon. Yeah, SME Media is like, uh, no thanks, but waiting for the fight. Or not, not gonna pay to see the fight. I think I would, just, it's a nice beagle. I think beagles are one of my favorite breeds. I would say beagles and then uh, yellow labs. I used to have a yellow lab. Now, the sad thing with uh, Labradors, particularly yellow and black labs, is as they age, their hips start to suffer really, really badly from arthritis. And uh, it's almost as if their hips like collapse in on themselves and their back legs just go all together and they can't walk. At least that's what happened with my dog. I've seen it many, many times in, in Labradors. Hey, Felipe is watching from Brazil. Good to see you. Ren1018 says, hey, Tom, flight was canceled earlier today. Where, where were you flying to? Somebody else just came in the chat like an hour ago and said the same thing, that their flight was canceled. Michael Joseph says it will definitely be a billion-dollar pay-per-view. Ben Cunningham says German Shepherds have the same issue. Did not know that. Yeah, it's sad to watch it, too, and it usually starts right around when the dog turns, like, 10 years old. So... So this is the beautiful hotel. And this is your view. I know, go versus, can you imagine how many illegal streams there'll be if that fight happens? I would assume a lot. But, you know, I was watching an interview with Dana White and allegedly, or I'll say supposedly, uh, Dana White does not play around with the illegal streaming. And he says every single person that uh, streams the UFC, UFC illegally, he's like, they go after. And, you know, those are serious, serious charges. I think it's significant jail time uh, and significant fines. He's like, uh, we don't play around with that. I think there was a story of a few college students, right? They just wanted to, you know, share the stream, illegally stream it. They were just kids doing it from their dorm room and Dana White showed no mercy on them. So we're now walking up Fifth Avenue A lot of traffic for a Tuesday night, would you say? A lot of traffic headed southbound on 5th. Hey, Dusty Cole, what's up? Good to see you. Ah, pineapple water. I didn't know that's what it was called. Hip dysplasia, I didn't know. Hey, Bob Eves, is that's what OMI in a Hellcat did? He bought cable TV and he streamed it for cheap. Really, Michael Joseph says Mark Zuckerberg does not like Elon Musk. I didn't know that. I didn't know that there was an actual real billionaire beef. We'll see. 
So this building actually used to be the old Lord and Taylor building. Who remembers this? Now, speaking of Mark Zuckerberg, didn't Meta acquire this building? Or at least some space in the building, if I remember correctly. And you could actually see some of the old signage of Lord and Taylor. Now, during the holidays in New York, uh, usually all the major department stores have these beautiful windows for the holidays. And I remember Lord and Taylor always used to have one of the most exciting uh, window displays for the holidays every single year. And when this went out of business, this was a real big blow to the community. I remember coming here as a kid and looking at all the holiday Christmas windows. And due to the Amazon effect, well, it is no more, it is closed. Who else remembers this Lord and Taylor here? Hey, Kevin KP says, thanks for the stream, Tom. Thank you, Kevin, for being here, I appreciate it. Lord and Taylor, fine jewelers. Established in 1826. I think they're doing office conversions here, I believe. That's the one Vanderbilt building up there. Now we're approaching the New York Public Library. However, there's a new and improved New York Public Library right to the right of us. And I've said this many times, but we do have a lot of new people here to walks in Wall Street. So if you're into finance, or if you're looking just to get into it, and your excuse is, well, I don't have any resources. I don't have, you know, any connections in the business. You know, how am I gonna, you know, learn about investing or, do anything on my own when I don't have any resources. Well, if you come to West 40th Street on the corner of Fifth Avenue and you enter the doors of the brand new New York Public Library, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the elevator to the fifth floor, one, two, three, four, five. You're gonna get out and that is the business center where every single day, uh, they actually have a newspaper shelf where they have the Wall Street Journal, Investors Business Daily and Barron's. So if you don't have enough money to sign up for subscriptions of those uh, financial sites, you could read them for free right here on the fifth floor. In addition, you can use all of the Bloomberg terminals. Yes, that is correct. They have free Bloomberg terminals. So if you've ever worked on Wall Street or at a big investment bank or at a hedge fund, chances are you're familiar with the Bloomberg terminal and that is a very, very expensive piece of financial software. Uh, it runs about $2,500 a month, a month, okay, for one license. So if you don't wanna pay that, you could sit here pretty much all day and use those terminals absolutely for free to do all your financial analysis, uh, research on particular companies. The only thing you can't do is you just can't take photographs, you can't export any data. So if you're building your financial models, you can't like export the data from uh, the terminal, which is, fair um so you essentially have every single resource right here on this corner in new york city that the most prominent and talented traders on wall street the most successful men and women on wall street all of the tools that they use to be successful you have access to for free free 99 right here so it's all about being a self-starter, seeking out the information yourself and putting in the time. I think that's one of the most, you know, beautiful things about New York City is everybody, you know, they complain about how expensive it is and, you know, they complain about the politics, but the people here are some of the smartest, well-rounded, ambitious, and educated people in the world. And the New York City, I should say, system uh, provides free resources for everybody. It just depends on if you take advantage of them or not. 
So check it out. Oh, Fredex. Here's one of the uh, drinking games. Here's the Lions in front of the Steven Schwartzman building. So tomorrow night on the live stream, we're gonna be talking about real estate, particularly uh, multifamily. And Steven Schwartzman is really the guy to talk to about real estate. You may be familiar with Steven Schwartzman from Blackstone. This is the original classic, I would say the most prominent and most well-known uh, library in the city. The original New York Public Library is right here. Beautiful. Yes, patience and fortitude. Hey, Madison32 is here. What's up? Sunshine after rain, always appreciate it. Hey, Mike and Lizzie says hello. Hey, Tom, any thoughts on the BlackRock ETF news? Yeah, it's a really good question. Thank you for tuning in. Um, as you know, I own Bitcoin. Uh, I've owned it and continue to buy it for a while now. I think the distinction is this, and I've sort of explained it before, but I think it's appropriate to explain it again. Over the last three weeks, we've had some major, I should say, events happen in the broader cryptocurrency space, where you had the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, with Gary Ginsler, who is the head of the SEC, actually sue Binance, Coinbase, and I believe Gemini, I think, not too sure, um, over their exchange soliciting these unlicensed securities, which is all of the altcoins. This is the Chrysler building, by the way, absolutely beautiful shot of 42nd Street and Fifth Avenue with Chrysler building in the distance. But I will say this, a lot of market participants that really don't understand what's going on, they think Binance, they think Coinbase, and they think Gemini is the same thing as Bitcoin, right? They think this is all like intertwined, when in reality, they have absolutely nothing to do with one another. So right as you had that news come out where the SEC sued these major broker dealers, right, in the cryptocurrency space, you had a big shakeout uh, in Bitcoin. And I think it was exactly that. I think it was just a big shakeout of novice investors really not knowing uh, what they own and selling their assets uh, because of the SEC. When in reality, if you paid attention to what Gary Ginsler has been saying, he's been saying that a lot of the alternative coins are securities, but Bitcoin is property. They've already made a decision that Bitcoin is property so if you own it, you know, you're not going to get in trouble with, you know, buying or selling unlicensed or unregistered securities. So I think you're going to start to see, we'll wait till the ambulance goes by. So I think you're going to start to see more and more major financial firms like the Black Rocks, the Fidelities, all the major broker dealers offering spot ETFs uh, of Bitcoin. Now there's an old saying on Wall Street that if the consumer or the public wants something, Wall Street is gonna make a product for it. Now, I can't, I can't give financial advice, but I'll tell you what I would do. If you're looking to get exposure to Bitcoin, I would never get exposure to it through these ETF products. Now, why would I say that? Well, I think it defeats the whole purpose of buying Bitcoin in the first place. The only value proposition that I see, the only one that I see in Bitcoin is that it is truly an unconfiscatable asset, right? Um, so if you own your private keys, you own the asset. Nobody could take it away from you. Why would you pay Wall Street, you know, 100 basis points uh, to store it for you? 
right? It doesn't really make any sense. Why would I pay, you know, I don't even know what the expense ratio is gonna be on this, but it's probably gonna be like 150 basis points, right, one and a half percent. Why would I pay BlackRock? Why would I pay Charles Schwab or Wall Street to custody um, my Bitcoin? when that totally negates the only material utility that the thing has, is true unconfiscatable store of value and medium of exchange, right? If, if you let a big bank or a broker dealer custody your Bitcoin, I think you're just speculating and you don't actually know what you're owning. So that's what I would say. Uh, cooking says is Berkeley College a community college? I don't think so. I think it's a very expensive private four-year college here in the city. Uh, very expensive is really the only thing that I could say. Yeah, Michael Joseph says also it could be a good hedge position. Hey, Brad's brain. What's up, man? So, so many simply do not understand what Bitcoin really is. Uh, trading an old coin is not the same, uh, but some cannot understand that. Yeah, dude, you're 100% right. And, um, you know, that's why I think you saw this big shakeout uh, in Bitcoin. I've even saw some people tweet about it. Like, see, I told you, you know, the SEC is cracking down on Bitcoin. No, they're cracking down on Binance and Coinbase for soliciting unlicensed and unregistered securities, which they are, right? I've said this for years now. Those altcoins are essentially just software companies that are raising money and soliciting their tokens to investors. Just, just because you have an initial coin offering and you call it something else doesn't mean it's not a security, right? Um, and I'm not a lawyer, right? I'm not even that smart of a guy. Uh, you know, but if you just read basic securities law, right? Again, not a lawyer, didn't go to law school you sort of understand what a security is or isn't. And it's quite clear in my view. But again, I don't really want to seem like I'm on the side of the SEC because I'm not. I'm actually very critical of Gary Gensler and his crew over there at the SEC. And I've been very critical for a while. Because um, the problem is this, there's actually a lot of really good companies uh, in the crypto space that are going to go overseas. This is, um, we're heading into Grand Central Terminal now. Uh, the only thing that the Securities and Exchange Commission needs to do is just to set a set of rules, right? Now, I'm a, I'm a pure capitalist, but I think regulation is very important, right? You'd have to be like an anarchist, like nut job to think otherwise, right? The only thing we're asking for is the government to provide a clear set of rules where businesses can operate in, right? And if you do that, that eliminates all the fraudulent and nefarious activity that goes on. And it also protects investors, right? Because once the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, you know, put out the statement that they're suing all of these exchanges, well, guess what? A lot of these altcoins that unfortunately uh, these people, retail investors were holding, they all crashed like 50 to 60%. So I don't know how that's sort of helping. I think well, if I was the chairman of the SEC, I would assemble a team uh, of professionals. I would you know, also hire consultants that are building within the cryptocurrency environment. And I would say, look, we need to establish a set of guidelines and rules for everybody to work within the same parameters. Let's hammer them out and let's put it out to the public. And if you're operating within those set of rules, you're good. If you're not, well, then you gotta go. And it's been years now and the SEC has been extremely derelict in their duties to provide regulatory clarity on anything cryptocurrency related. So guess what? You have the wild, wild west. You have people ripping each other off and it's a horror show pretty much. Um, and I think the SEC is largely to blame for that. All right, real quick. Um, we are now inside the beautiful, the gorgeous Grand Central Terminal. This is 
one of my favorite places in the city. Hey, Joan Kay is here, good to see ya. Now, if you look all the way at the top right, there's a little black dot. Does everybody see that? I've showed you guys this a million times, but we do have some new people. So if you zoom in all the top on this little black dot, this is actually what the ceiling used to look like before they revamped and restored the station. Now, think about all the cigarette smoke, all of the cigar smoke that's been smoked here over the years. It's a lot. And all of that tar and all that nonsense coated the ceiling in this cancerous filth. So they cleaned everything and they left that little rectangle to uh, remind everybody of what used to be. Kind of cool. <laughs> Western Mass Dave says, yeah, and please show us a million more. We definitely will. It's a beautiful train station. One of the, I would say the most beautiful train station in New York uh, is right here in Grand Central Terminal. This is the Apple store. Tomorrow we're gonna talk about Tim Cook uh, in India. Tim Cook is making a big bet on the Indian economy. I'm also very bullish on India. Hey, custom built American fire trucks is here. Good to see you. Check my battery. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, this is the Metro North. So this will take you upstate. But also, thank God, they finally have the East Side Access Project here that opened earlier. So you can now for all of our Nassau County and Suffolk County friends. Uh, you can take the train here. Ooh, yes, that's the, uh, was a very good comment. Who said that? JPA says there's a bar hidden uh, inside. It's called the Campbell Bar. You are 100% right. And that is the most gorgeous bar I have ever been to in my life. Uh, and I would recommend anybody it's very expensive, I'll say that. Very, very expensive place, but it is 100,000% worth it. Um, if you're, especially if you're going on a business meeting and you want to impress a client, I would take them there. Uh, the architecture is so beautiful. I think it used to be the office, I forget who, um, but it used to be an office and they converted it into a bar. It's sort of like a bar and mini restaurant. It is stunning there. This past uh, Christmas, I went to a corporate holiday party in there and they hired um, a person to play the cello, a person to play the piano, it was gorgeous. Um, it was a really good time. This is the food court. Obviously everything's closed down now because it's so late at night. Now the opening to the East Side Access Project is right here. You'll see it'll say to the Long Island Railroad. It's downstairs. Here it is. Ah, JPA, John W. Campbell, thank you for that. So this is to Grand Central Madison. This is where I go to uh, head home. 
Hey, Madison32, it's Tom. I have to take uh, go to sleep. Have a very productive night. I think we got to call it quits tonight as well. Hold on. Yeah, I'll take you guys. I got to go down to the train anyway, so I'll take you guys down into the underworld and then we'll call it quits. But if you guys enjoyed the live stream tonight, feel free to leave a like on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Feel free to check out the links in the description here. You can connect with us off YouTube by following us on Twitter. We always post a lot of our financial analysis and connect uh, during work hours there. You could sign up for our free investing newsletter. Here's the concourse. You can tell everything's brand new. All right, so Sally, appreciate you coming. Wendy England, B Cruz, Hawaii. Thank you so much. Daniel G from Argentina. Always a pleasure to get to chat with you, my friend. Zozo Bob, I do have my umbrella. <laughs> It was raining on and off today. Fred X, God bless you, sir. Wendy England, Zozo Bob, hopefully I'll be seeing you in Miami very soon. I'm working on a very interesting project in Miami. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised once I tell you. British Gray from Tampa, Florida, thanks for joining. Stephen Bates, uh, Jay-Z, Hang With Mark Mom, Joan K. There's always a bull market somewhere. You just need to know where to look. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care.